Hey, thanks for tuning in. I got a great show for you tonight. Uh, we got Mike Francais on here tonight, and uh, we all know who Mike is. Great guy, Christian guy. Uh, we had a great uh, show tonight. Uh, and he even talked a little about the Sammy LeBeau interview that's coming out soon on uh, Value Entertainment with Patrick. So stay tuned. This is going to be a great show. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am that you're here. You know, I haven't seen you, so I think it was 2017, the last time I saw you. We did that Comedy Central yeah, show together. That was that little spoof we did that time, huh, Bobby? Yeah, that came out good. That was really nice. I got a lot of compliments right. on that. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here, Mike. Mike, everybody knows who you are. I mean, right now, out of all of us guys, you're the biggest one out there, you know? And I know, well, I know you told uh, your story a hundred times. What I want to do is just convince a little more with you about that. I'm sure that all my audience and my viewers have, uh, know who you are, see your stuff, you know? But if you want to talk a little about yourself before we get started, tell them a little about your background. Yeah, well, you know, I, I know... You are familiar for sure, and I think a lot of people are by now. I've been doing this, Bobby, for 25 years between speaking on the road and, you know, various documentaries, and now YouTube, something we discovered just in the last year or so, thanks to, uh, thanks to the pandemic in large part. But, um, yeah, the, the platform has increased. But, you know, my, my dad was uh, at one time the underboss of the Colombo family back in New York, one of the five New York Cousin Oster families. Sorry, yeah. And, um, you know, he was a pretty well-respected guy at the time, and he was a guy that I loved, you know, I, I loved and uh, really admired my father. He was my hero growing up. And, uh, but he had a lot of trouble early on in his life when I was a kid, so I, I, you know, I knew and understood what the life was about because of all the trouble my dad had. He was a major target of law enforcement from the time I was a kid, and I know you can relate to that. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, he, he initially did his best to keep me out of the life. He wanted me to go to school, be a doctor. I was on that road until, uh, you know, things changed in the 60s with a number of indictments and trials my dad had. Uh, it ended up uh, in him being convicted in a big federal case and sentenced to 50 years in prison. And I knew, uh, you know, my dad always told me that uh, it was a bad case, that he wasn't guilty. They, they allegedly... Uh, said that he uh, masterminded a nationwide string of bank robberies. I didn't believe my father was a bank robber. It wasn't something that he would do. And, uh, you know, he told me he was framed. And, uh, you know, I was a, a, a college kid. I had just entered college um, when my dad went in to do that 50 years. Joe Colombo, who I was close to at the time, our family was close, he kind of took me under his wing, started meeting a lot of my dad's friends. That, you know, Mike, what are you doing going to school? If you don't help your father out, he's going to die in prison. So long story short, I lost interest in school. I went to visit my dad in Leavenworth Penitentiary and told him, you know, if I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. And after a lengthy conversation, he tried to discourage me, but my mind was made up. I really just wanted to help him, Bobby. That was my whole motivation. And he said, if you're going to be on the street, then I want you on the street the right way. He proposed me for membership into that life. Uh, I was 21 years old, and uh, just a couple of years later, in 1975, I was uh, took an oath and became a... Uh, you know, a made man in the Colombo family. And, uh, you know, as you know, you come in as a soldier. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to do everything to help my dad and, and be the best possible mob guy I could be, honestly. I wanted to make him proud and I wanted to do the right thing with respect to the oath that I took. Um, I, was, uh, I was fortunate. I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. I was very aggressive on the street. Went on to uh, bring some new things into the family. I made a, a considerable amount of money. Mm -hmm. 1980, the boss of my family at that time, Carmine Persico, made me a cop regime. And from 80 until about 95, I operated in that capacity. And then, uh, you know, I, I became a major target of law enforcement myself. I think I had, you know, I had seven indictments. I had two federal racketeering cases, one state racketeering. I beat a number of cases. Um, and then I took a plea on uh, one racketeering case. 
10-year prison sentence, $15 million restitution. And um, I had, around the same time, I met a young girl who's now my wife of 37 years, Bobby. And uh, uh, God bless. she's a young bless. Christian girl, yeah, a girl of faith. Her and her mom were very strong, uh, you know, in their beliefs. And I just felt at the time, if I was going to marry this girl who I wanted to and remain in this life, what kind of life am I going to give her? Because I saw my whole family get destroyed. And it was at that time I made the decision to walk away from that life. And that was back in uh, really, you know, the early 90s. And, um, you know, I mean, I can go on and on and on. But uh, I can tell you this, I'm probably one of the most blessed guys that's ever going to appear on your show. Because as you know, I could very well be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. But uh, I think God had a different plan and a purpose for me. He did, Mike. And it was obvious. You know, um, when I was in uh, Arizona, you know, I did 14 years in prison. And when I was in Arizona, my mother sent me uh, your book. My mother's been watching you for years, Mike. She loves you. My mother started a church in East Boston in 1980, you know, a denominational church. And she says, you know, Mike's going to be a good inspiration for you. And, you know, I read the book, and I seen what you went through, because I had the similar problems with my father and him being in the life and uh, getting involved in the war in the 1990s, you know. And it was inspiring to me to read your book. And uh, I saw a lot of your videos, and, uh, you know, I, I always kept after you, want to watch everything that you were doing, because the way that you turn your life around is a blessing, Mike. I mean, look at where you were. Now, I know uh, what you were running in New York with the gas game and all of that, and, you know, you run million-dollar businesses over there. I was in Boston. I was a cop of the regime up there. You know that. Uh, uh, and... Um, we were into gambling, the drugs, we were into everything, Mike. And I, and I made a few million right away when I come back in the 90s and hit the street, you know. But uh, what you were doing back in New York, and I seen you were getting involved in Hollywood and making movies and doing these different things, you always had a business mind, you know. And, and I did too. I took my business sense and I took it into the street, you know, when I got back on the street because the wall was starting, my father was involved, my family... And I just felt I had to get involved in that. And that's what pushed me to uh, become a main guy, a capo, and, you know, running my crew up there. But when I did find Christ, and I seen the truth, like I know you did, Mike, it's hard to look back on that life. It's hard to say, how could we ever really do that again, you know? And uh, I'll tell you, you've been an inspiration for me, Mike. You really have, you know? Uh, you know, I appreciate that, Bobby. I didn't know that uh, until now. But, you know, it's always encouraging to hear, you know, that somebody was inspired by you. And, and you know, hopefully uh, it, it, it aided in turning your life around. Because, Bobby, you know as well as I do, you know, I don't, I don't like to be the one to, I'm never going to glorify the life because it's not no. a life that deserves to be glorified, as you know. I don't want to knock the guys in that life. I mean, we were one of them. We just oh, have yeah. to be very yeah. blessed. You know, but um, it, it's a bad life. I mean, you know, you know this. I, I have not known, and, and I mean this, I can't think of any family, of any member of that life that I knew that wasn't totally devastated. And I always yeah. say any, any lifestyle, whether it be the gang, the mob, Cosa Nostra Mafia, any lifestyle that is that damaging to families has to be a bad lifestyle. And, that, and that's the conclusion that we came to. And, uh, you know, sometimes people don't understand, you know, and I, you know, I'm honest about, oh, Michael, you're a rat and this and that. You know, I don't pay attention to that. No, we, we, that's, that's nonsense. Yeah, yeah we, we, we know what we are and, and why we did what we did. And, you know, there's certainly no perfection in us. But uh, I think God, you know, has shown us something, given us the right direction and a path that hopefully leads us to where we both want to be uh, in all of eternity. And that, that's how I look at it. I, you know, I look at it the same way. You know, someone uh, wrote me on my show the other day. You know, we got a small show here, you know that. And uh, said, Bobby, you're not revelant. Why do you keep doing this? I says, well, if 10 people just watch my show, I'm going to keep doing this. Because I know 10 people are getting messages and 10 people are enjoying it. You know what Jesus said, when two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. And, I, you know, I look at everything like that, Mike, you know. I mean, you've been doing this for 25 years. You've been all over the world. You've been in all these churches, everything, these congregations, everything you've been doing. You know, I'm just getting out there. I'm just getting started with it. Back in uh, 2013, when I got out of prison, um, I don't know if I told you, but in prison, I got a degree in theology. 
and I wrote a Christian book. Uh, actually broke down my studies and my classes in a summary in a book. And uh, when I got out, I became a pastor for a short time. I had a TV show on Channel 6 down there in Tennessee, a Christian show. And uh, I was getting, getting into all these things. But I think you know as much as I do, um, we love God and we want to serve God. But that doesn't always pay the bills either. You know, and I was doing all these shows, Mike. Uh, down there. I didn't know what I was doing with these cameras and these different things and every show that I shot was costing me about a thousand dollars Then I had to put it up on the TV, you know, and uh, it, it got expensive for me But I really loved and I enjoyed teaching But I'm trying to find a platform to do that now and I think maybe I could spring that off of this show and start doing a teaching on the YouTube channel and that's what I'm inspired to do right now. That's what I think I'm going to try to do. You know? Well, I want to encourage you, Bobby, because, look, you know, nobody starts out like a rocket. And uh, you got a great story, you know, and, it, and I know it's sincere. I know you're sincere. And, you know, I would say this. Listen, you know what? Uh, when one person enters the kingdom, all of heaven rejoices. So yes. we don't know. You know, we don't know what our real purpose is, how many people we're impacting. You're not going to know that until you get to heaven. People... You know, and let you know, hey, Bobby, I, I saw you and you, you brought me here, you know? Yeah. So I, I encourage you because uh, it, it didn't start off like a rocket for me either. I mean, I worked hard. Bobby, I can't tell you. Oh, I know. I mean, right. You know, I was spending so much time away from my family, just, uh, you know, being in different churches, traveling around the country. Uh, it wasn't easy in the beginning. Um, and it's not easy now. You know, we still do a lot of work. But look, if we feel this is our calling, we pursue it. And, you know, God will take care of the rest. I do. I believe that, Mike. You know, listen, we don't all have to be up on a platform in a church and teaching and preaching all the time to spread his word or to do good work. Just the way that we've both changed in our lives and what we're doing now shows his glory. I believe that. You know, we sit down and, you know, I'm a, I'm a lot like you on my show. I don't really like to talk about violence. You know, there's some stories, people ask me some things, I'll talk about that. But I don't like to glorify those things on my show. I know if I started talking uh, nonsense and this and that, like some of these other people, I know I would get a lot more viewers, but I'd rather not have the viewers, Mike, if it comes down to that. I want to be myself. I want to come out here. I want to enjoy myself. And uh, I, I still want to do God's work. I want to try as much as I can to do that. You know, and I, and I believe if I came on there with that attitude... Uh, you know, that's not showing glory. No, it's not, Bobby. And you know what? Your approach is the right approach. You know, and, and I say this too, you know, without being specific, you, you want to be your own person. You don't, you don't want to make your way by knocking other people and by glorifying the life and showing how tough we were. Look, I, I'm sure you're in the same position as I am because what people don't understand, when you're in that life and you're told to do something, you got to do it. It's you not a question whether you're a tough guy you got to do what you're told to do or you don't last in the life. End That's of right. story. And, uh, you know, and, and I say this, too, and I'm not, I'm not shy about it. You know, there were things that I didn't want to do, Bobby. I didn't feel good about it. Mm -hmm. I had to some, somehow step out of myself to do it yeah. uh, because I would never, you know, not do what I was told. But I didn't feel good about it. Um, and I still don't. Even today, I don't. I know, you know, in, in our faith, we believe that if we sincerely confess our sins, we're forgiven. And that's what I stand by. But right. But, uh, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of guys are talking to who they killed and this and that. I, I don't think that's stuff that we should be really, uh, uh, you know, emphasizing in our, our past life. That's my opinion. Yeah, no, no, I do feel the same way, you know. You know, I found Christ uh, 15 months before I got arrested. I had a spiritual experience, Mike. Really? And, uh, you know, my, I told you, my mother had the church, and the pastor came over, the whole family come over, blessed, and I took the host that night, March 27, 1998. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I seen the truth. When I seen that night, there was a devil, and there is a Jesus. When you see that truth, how can you turn from it, you know? So I had to start walking down a different path while I was on the street, and I had to keep that a secret, because you know in our life, if they see us starting to get weak, uh, moving in a different direction, you know, we could have a problem no matter who we were, you know. 
So I had to keep that to myself, and I was going to my mother's church, and a main guy in my crew, Tommy, uh, he was, uh, I would say, my driver bodyguard. He ended up becoming a born again, praying in tongues, and, you know, that was a great thing. He ended up uh, kind of leaving the crew before I got arrested in 99. Uh, I think people think I went to prison, or like you, and we were like holy jumpers in prison. That's not true. You know, uh, I found God on the street. But I, I was able, that 14 years that I had, Mike, was a blessing to me. And people say, how is it a blessing doing 14 years in prison? When you're in God's presence for 14 years, you're being taught by the Holy Spirit. And he's turning your life around. I needed to. I needed to be in prison because that's how I was able to if if I went into population Mike I still would have been a couple you know that I would have been around all the guys you know uh, the 14 years I did I was in nice blocks uh, I was able to study get a degree I wrote a book you know and uh, I'll tell you when God touched my life that night there was no turning back Mike and people don't understand that no, you know, no. a few years after, go ahead, Mike, I'm sorry. No, no, you know, I, I understand that. I mean, I, I did eight years, but um, it was really the, the uh, close to three years that I spent in solitary that the Lord touched my heart. And, you know, people say, well, you found Jesus. No, I didn't find Jesus. He found me. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. uh, I know for a fact, Bobby, and I know you relate to that. Had I not been in that hole and gone to prison, I was on the street. I would have never accepted the Lord. I had too many distractions. I was too much a, a part of that life. Um, I, I think God God didn't put me in that hole. I put myself in that mess, but he used that time to work on my mind and my heart. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for it. I hated every minute being in there, but looking back, I'm thankful because he saved my life. There's no doubt about it. And he saved mine. I should not be sitting here, Mike. And praise God I am because of him, you know? And then he's blessing me again with this show. You know, he's blessing me in my life in a lot of different ways. And I know everything that I have now comes from him, not Satan. And that's the good thing, you know. I'll tell you, I found, like I said, 15 months before I went to prison, I found Christ, Mike. But, you know, we were still selling drugs, extorting, loan shocking, gambling. And there was still a few guys that had to be uh, taken care of, if you understand what I'm saying. Yes. And the day that I got arrested, and you might be able to understand this too, the feds came to my house and took me. They were walking me to the car and it felt like a yoke broke off my shoulders. Like a physical yoke. Like I was carrying something. It broke off of me. It was amazing, it was spiritual. It broke off of me. And I was actually smiling when they put me in the back of the car. I felt a relief. I can't explain it because I said then, this is over. So God had to take me out and put me in prison. I, I understand, Bobby. You know, a lot of people uh, might have difficulty with understanding that, but I do. I mean, you had a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. God had his hand on you, and, um, you know, the result is what it is right now. So, you know, you, you're doing his work, and, and uh, look, I admire you for it because I know it's not easy to make this transition, no matter what anybody thinks. Even when God is, is in your heart and the Holy Spirit's working on you, it's still not easy. Because we're still a product of who, of who we were. You know, I always say, you know, you can take the boy out of Brooklyn. You can't take Brooklyn out of the boy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we still fight urges at times to do things. And, you know, instinct comes back. But, you know, the key for me was surrounding myself with good people. People that want to hold me accountable. You know, Bobby, I tell people all the time. I do a lot of men's ministries. And I ask them, I say, I want you to get home. I want you to look in the mirror. And I want you to ask yourself honestly, who are you accountable to? You know, when I was in the life, you were in the life, we were accountable to our oath, to our boss, to, right. to what we had to do on the streets. And therefore, we went in the direction that we went with. When we came to Christ, well, now we're accountable to God. That's we're accountable right. to our family that loves us, that wants to see us do right, to people that are depending upon us, you know, to spread the word and do the right thing. 
And accountability in life is everything. And I tell these guys, if you're not accountable to God, you're in the wrong direction right off the bat. That's so right. You better, you better clean up your act and get moving in the right direction. And, uh, you know, that's what keeps me straight. No, no doubt about it. You know, sometimes, Mike, I feel like I'm walking a toddling fence. You know, I'm right back in my neighborhoods or back in Boston. And I'll hear a story here and there or someone might say something. And, you know, that old thing comes back up in you. We know the type of men that we were before, you know, but then there's something else that's pressing it back down. And then, you know, if you keep your faith, everything's going to be okay. You know, I say this, vengeance is mine, says the law, that's number one. And number two, he says in Psalms, what? The Lord is my shield and buckler, you know, and this is my belief. And this is what I have to believe. The old days, Mike, me and you would have picked up a gun or a knife. Today, we go pray about it. We pray about it. And you know something? He's over us and he's watching. We yeah, walk so in his yeah. destiny now, not our own. You know, Bob, it was a time I never thought I'd, I'd reach 70 years old, but uh, here we are. I know you're a little bit younger than me, but we made it this far and it was only with God's help. There's no doubt. You know, and, and, and people got to understand that. God's got a plan and a purpose for everyone's life. It's up to us, you know, to go to him and have him help us fulfill it. But uh, he's got a plan for all of us, and it's whether we, we have a free will, whether to, uh, to seek him or not. And once we do, you know, the Holy Spirit inspires us to move in a certain direction, and, mm -hmm. and that's how it works. And, uh, you know, all we can do is, is tell people about it. You know, we plant seeds. We inspire people. We don't turn anybody into Christians. We, don't, we can't impose our faith on anyone, but nope. we can plant seeds and lead. And that's what we're, we're obligated to do that. I tell people, listen. Mark 16, 15, you know, the last command that Jesus gave us, go out and preach or share the good word with all of creation. And that's where that's all, right. every Christian is obligated to do that. Mm -hmm. And then God will do the rest. You know, it's just, you know, uh, different people. Now, look at guys that are on the street that call in the show, that talk to me, that are on the social media with me. They see that we did this, Mike. They see that they have an opportunity, too, that they could see and do what we did. I don't care what anybody says. Anybody that gets deep in their life like we were in it, they get disillusioned. They don't want to be in the life anymore. You know, when I found Christ, I didn't want it anymore, Mike. You know, I was set to have my own family up there. It was going to be the Luisi family. That's the deal that I made uh, with Joey Molino. Really? I was going to stay two years as a copper with him, and then I was going to break off. After I found Christ... I didn't even want to be a mad guy anymore, never mind uh, having my own family, like, you know. Because I, I, I know you know what happened in Boston and Philly. Me and Joey came up about the same way. There was a war in both cities, yes. you know, and, and Joey took me and the family. Uh, at that time, you know, Mike, I was a diehard gangster. I didn't care about life or anything else, you know. I was arrogant, self-centered. Uh, Vile man. I mean, I can't, you know, tell you how bad I was, you know, but uh, what Christ did in my life was amazing. And that night, like I said, I didn't even want to be a main man anymore. I wanted to see Christ after that. And uh, we well, were all bad, Bobby, at that point, you know. Let's, let's face it, we can't sugarcoat what we were and what we did. Right. You know, I mean, people talk on the internet, you know, who is the toughest guy, who is this. You know, I try to tell them, listen, what you don't understand is this, you know. We were all bad guys. Yeah. We, all had, we all did what we had to do. We were all breaking the law. We were all doing things that weren't right. So, you know, did one guy do more than the other? What's the difference, you know? You, we were all bad guys at that point in time. And, and uh, you know, to you and I know, Bobby, if you would have stayed in that life, you'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of your life. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. No doubt, especially when you get high profile. Once they got that bullseye on your back, you're done. That's oh, it. yeah. yeah. You no, know, it's over. So people just don't understand, you know, how extremely blessed we are to be in the situation that we're in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and I, I think, well, I shouldn't say that. Not everybody does, but so many people do. And it's such an inspiration for them. Hey, if this guy can turn his life around. Um, you know, then I got to try that too. You know, maybe there is something to this God thing. And I've said, so many people have said that to me, Michael, if, if God can make a transformation in your life, same with you, Bobby, then he can do it for me. And, and that's the message. That's it. Well, it says in the Bible, we have to be an example. 
you know, people say, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you, Mike. I still smoke cigarettes. You know, I'm not. I'm the. I'm the. I'm divorced twice. I go out once in a while. I, I'm not a drinker. I never was really a drug user. You know, but uh, I still like to have a scotch once in a while, like a glass of wine with dinner. You know, and I just live as a normal person. If you didn't know who, that I was a Christian and that I used to be a pastor and a theologian. You would never know by talking with me, by sitting with me. But if it does come up in a conversation, I'm definitely going to go there with it. But I don't feel like you, that we should push it on people, that we should just lead by example. And then when they come, that's the best thing. You know why? Because that's the Holy Spirit pulling them into you. You know? And, and that's when the glory comes for them. And Christ's glory. And I didn't mean to make this uh, Christian show here tonight, Mike. But I got to tell you, the church is going to be watching this. You know, my mother's going to be watching. And, you know, people can laugh at me at that. But I'll tell you, her church, you know, the Holy Spirit was there. Mike, praying in tongues. So many gifts that he's given me that I didn't deserve, you know. So... I didn't really want to get too much into the Christian stuff, but I'm happy we're talking about it. No, listen, hey, you know what? Uh, this is what we're supposed to do. You know, it's, know. Just natural, it's natural conversation for us. It's not it like, it, uh, you know, it's anything that we had to plan or script. It, it, it is what it is. Yeah. And look, you know, I, I talk, I, I, I'll be honest with you. You know, I talk a lot about the mob stuff and my mob because I'm trying to broaden my platform. And the bottom line, in the past three weeks, I've been to eight cities, and in each city, I was preaching the gospel. God and bless. The more people that, the bigger the platform you have, the more people you're able to reach. You know, sometimes I get knocked on, uh, you know, social media. They say, Michael, you're talking too much about the mob. You know, and I try to explain to them, listen, you know, on, God gave me a platform. That's right. Fortunately, or unfortunately, Bobby, I've been all over the world. From Singapore to Australia, Bulgaria, United Kingdom, you name it. You know, this mob genre, people are aware of it. Oh, yeah. It gives, yeah. Yeah, it gives you a platform to be able to go and, and preach the gospel at some point, And you use what God has given you. Because I tell people, listen, what the enemy meant for bad, God will turn around and use for his glory. Absolutely. I don't glorify the life like you don't. But mm -hmm. if it gives us a platform to go and, and be able to preach the word, then, then we use it. And we use it effectively. And, you know, people say, oh, Michael, you're talking too much about the life. I said, look, you know what? Um, don't mistake my, you know, expanding my reach so that I can go out and preach the gospel as anything but, you know, that. Because my belief is strong. You know, look, there's nothing in the Bible that says Christians are perfect. That's and right. Never, well. Nothing in the Bible that says that. We're still sinners at some point in time. We mm -hmm. know that we're a lot better than we were when we were in that life because right. God makes us better. God transforms us from the inside out. There's no question about it. But um, look, you know, it, we, we have an obligation to go out and use whatever tools God has given us, you know, to, to try to fulfill what his purpose is in our life. And that's how I look at it. And I know you're doing the same thing. And mm -hmm. I just want to encourage, you know, you, God bless your mom. You know, I know she's played a significant role in you being where you are. And I know it's it's the prayers of our mother and our wives and That's the right. people that love us to get us to where we are. So just continue what you're doing. And, you know, look, things can happen when you're not even aware of it. And all of a sudden, God will put an opportunity in front of you, Bobby, and it'll it'll even expand you further than what you are right now. I know. I, I, I feel that's coming soon. I, I feel he's going to elevate me again somewhere, Mike. You know? But I want to say something about uh, the way they're knocking you with that. First of all, like you're very charismatic. You have a great production. Everything you do is authentic. You know, you got You have a great platform. People love the men that we used to be. Yes, I mean everybody in this world they love gangsters. You know, I too have an audience from New Zealand, uh, Australia. I mean, they're coming in from everywhere. You know. And they love that genre, and they love the gangster thing. And there's nothing wrong with, with us being on a platform talking about that. We're talking about the past and actually how bad it was. We're not promoting it. You know, I said in prison, when they used to come to, I had good Bible classes in prison, theology classes. 
And, you know, a few wise guys said to me, you know how they are during the yeah. time. You know, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? He says, you know something? When I was on the street, I was handing out guns to people. That was our life. Now I want to hand out Bibles to people. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, the gun crosses over with the Bible. It does. But that platform that you're on, look at what you're doing for people. Mike, if you're in one church and move one soul, Mike, how beautiful is that? Absolutely. That's your job. That's what he wants you to do. You know? Yeah, time i mean i get you know messages and emails you know on a daily basis from people that have been impacted because we're out there they heard our testimony you know then sometimes you know a lot of times bobby you know we'll be talking about a mob thing and then somebody will google and they'll find out and they go oh this guy's a christian and then all of a sudden they start searching and they see you know 20 or 30 of my testimonies on there and it starts to impact them but how did we get their attention you know, by giving them something that they're, they're right. interested in. That's right. But again, but again we're, I, I know you are, because I've watched, we're careful not to glorify the life. We're not saying that. We're not mm -hmm. saying it's a good life. We're saying the opposite. And uh, but, but to get people's attention so that they listen to us and then see, wait, you know, God transformed this guy's life. i got to look into this. And that's, and that's what I think, you know, for me it's 25 years, so something's got to be right about it. Yeah. You know, God wouldn't have allowed this continue uh, the way he has. So that's a, we have to be doing something right, Bobby. Yeah, we are. God bless, we are. You know, every day, you know, Mike, I know the money you had on the street and the millions you made with everything, you know, in your day. And I went to prison. When I went to prison, I had, you know, I had money, Mike. But, you know, it was blood money. Yeah. That was all bad money. And uh, I came out of prison broke. You know, I got remarried when I came out of prison. I'll tell you a little about myself fast, because, you know, uh, you're the guest there, not me. But um, even though I, you know, I keep falling down, he keeps picking me back up on my finances, you know? Yeah. I got so much into this show and everything that we're doing, and uh, I just don't worry about it no more, because I know one way or another, a blessing is going to come. You know, I know I'm going to get through it. And as long as I keep faith in him, things are going to be okay, Mike. No, you you know, know, at 60 years old, I'm not financially where I want to be, but you know how things could turn, you know? No, well, listen, you, you'll get there. But look, I've been up and down my whole life, you know. Yeah. Hey, people don't understand. You know, Michael, you, know, you do eight years in prison, you, you defend yourself on six or seven cases, two of them being racketeering cases. You're paying lawyers through the nose. Then supporting your family while you're away. I mean, you know, I was blessed. My wife didn't have to work, my kids. But, but you know, what do you expect to come out of jail with? You know, I mean, it's tough. And you did 14 years. I mean, come on. You know, that's that's reality sets in. You come out and you try to rebuild your life. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you're doing it the right way. Exactly. And you're right. God will provide. Look, I've had, you know, as much money as I, I have, a lot more than I ever needed. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what did it do for me? It got me in jail. You know, so now God has enabled me to rebuild my life, not anywhere near where it was before, but I don't need it. I look at money differently. To me, to me, it's comfort. You know, I want to, I'll be honest, you know, I want to be able to pay my bills, go on vacation when I want, go out to dinner, enjoy myself with my wife and kids. That's what I look at. I'm not looking to conquer the world or to be the richest guy around. I mean, I, I, that attitude in me changed a long time ago. Well, you know, when we were on the street, we had to drive for that, Mike. That's what we wanted. You know, and then we learned that uh, the money wasn't the important part about this in our lives anymore. You know, I don't have the drive even to even think to go out and uh, make that kind of money anymore. I'm not interested in that kind of money anymore. If I got a car, a nice place to live, there's food on the table, and my bills are paid, I don't need anything else in life. I really don't. It's not lack of ambition because you can see I'm very ambitious in whatever I do. And I do 150%, you know. But I'd rather 
go in the direction of it now, then going back and trying to stop business again, do this, do that. I don't, I don't want that anymore. Even, even legal business. I just don't have the strength for it anymore, Mike. You now, that's, know? For young, that's for younger guys, Bobby. Yeah, I think it is. I, I think it is, Mike, you know. Hey, I found out one thing. I got a lot of young, aggressive guys around me, and if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't even know what to do on YouTube. You know, they point me in the right direction to do this, do that. But, you know, I, I always have this uh, motto that I've had really my whole life, and that is do what you do best, delegate the rest. And you got to find the right people. And we, you know, as, as street guys, too, we know how to motivate them and get the most out of them. And, That's right. You know, you're as good as the team. You're, you're always as good as the people you have around you. And uh, I attribute a lot of you know, the success I've had to, uh, to picking some good people. I've made some mistakes too, Bobby. Oh you know, yeah. I'm yeah. not always the greatest judge of character. Um, my wife in that regard is better than I am. I think she's more careful, but, but you know, what are you going to do? That's life. You, you live it day by day and, uh, you, you win some, you lose some, but at my age, our age, we don't want to lose too many more. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, you know, with our backgrounds, Mike, we want to give everybody a shot. Even if we have a little doubt in them, we want to give them a shot. You know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it don't. But at least you have a heart to do that. You know what I'm saying? And that's a good thing. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of easy at times with things. You know, I got to bring it up because I've been getting, I, I, you've probably seen that I'm, I had to sit down with Sammy, with Sammy Gravano. Yeah. And it's uh, starting to get a lot of play. My friend Patrick put this whole thing together and, and, uh, the comments coming in, I, I got to tell you, Bobby, social media in, in some ways has exposed the lunacy in the world. I mean, yeah. I, I really mean it, you yeah. know, it's just, you know, because people can say, and I don't, I don't mean it in a bad way. It's just, it's amazing that the interest people have in things that I, I wouldn't even give a second thought to, you know, I, know. I mean, I, I, it just shows you how different people can be. But you know, to, to bring out with Sammy, I mean, Sammy's a different kind of guy. We're not friends, so I'm going to be honest with you. We don't yeah, really I know that. Together. You know, and Sammy and I, we, we weren't friendly before all this happened when we were both on the street. But, you know, look, I looked at it as an opportunity to maybe get to his heart a little bit. I don't know if I succeeded or not. He's a different kind of guy. You know, I know that we, it was got contentious between us. Um, in, in a way, and, it, and believe me, it wasn't scripted. It was it was Sammy saying what he had in his mind and me responding to him, basically. But very interesting, you know, very interesting to see that kind of mentality still at this point in time. I know, you know, I'm amazed too with that. And uh, I seen, a, you know, the few little clips, you know, there's a big, everybody's anticipating this big uh, powwow between you two. We're all dying to see it. But here's the difference now in, in gangsters and men, you know, and it's going to come out now, you know. Listen, Mike, you know how to carry yourself. You know how to handle yourself. You were groomed properly, okay. I'm not taking nothing against Sammy. I like Sammy. I'm not saying anything against him, you know. Sammy, Sammy is uh, rough around the edges, but he's got that gangster mentality, and that's like uh, it's going to be the rest of his life. You know, and it's, yeah. it's just, when I watch him, I see it, and you see it, because we know it, you know, and, I, you know, you two getting together, I can't, I'm dying to see this, Mike, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm dying to see this sit down. Well, I, I think you're going to be pretty surprised, because, you know, I didn't want to do it, neither did he, Patrick just kept pushing and pushing, and, you know, and I have a relationship with Patrick, I know him for a couple of years, he's a really good guy, mm -hmm. and uh, he just kept pushing, I mean, he just... And then I'm saying, you know what, maybe he's pushing for a reason, maybe it's something we should do. And uh, it took him a long time, but he got to me and then somehow Sammy agreed. I didn't think Sammy would ever agree with it, honestly. I, I really didn't. You know, and honestly, we said a few things about each other that weren't, you know, that were a little bit offensive. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. look, you know, I mean, I had a lot of influence from my father and my dad and I talked about things with Sammy beforehand, so I made a remark or two. And he made some things about me. And one of the things, you know, he didn't believe my faith. But, you know, that's that's the first thing everybody knocks about a Christian, you know. Oh, they don't yeah. Do it a, you know, Bobby, it's amazing. They don't do it about a Jew. They don't do it about, you know, a, a person in Islam. Only Christians. We're the ones that get knocked right away. Oh, he's phony Christian. He's a phony Christian. Yep. You know, so, of course, I mean, I've, I've heard that many, many times. And, you know, after a while, 
you know, it, it doesn't bother you because we know who we are. That's right. But, uh, you know, so we said a couple of things, and maybe he still don't believe it. Who knows, you know? But it was a very strange, uh, it was very strange to get together, I can tell you that. And to see his mentality still. Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, Sammy still has that callus over his heart. And Sammy's heart, he's still a gangster, you know? Yeah. And uh, only God can remove that, Mike. You know that. Like he took no, it from our hearts. You know, I had, I got to tell you, I had a pastor call me up um, who I had, I had met years ago. I don't know how, I hadn't spoken to him in years, but he called me up and he said, you know, I'm going to, and he's a, he's kind of, you know, it all depends on your approach, Bobby, when you're approaching people and trying to minister to them. But he's very in your face kind of guy, right? Yeah. So he calls me, I'm calling Sammy Gravano. I was really, how did you get to him? I forget how he got to him. He said, could you give me any insight? I said, well, I don't, I don't know him. You know, I mean, I know what you know. I said, but you want to go preach to him? Go ahead. Long story short, you know, Sammy got pretty upset with this guy. But I told the guy, I said, you know what? Sometimes you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. You don't get into a guy's face right away. No. Start telling no. him he's going to hell and all this kind of stuff. I said, especially a guy like Sammy, he don't back down. No. You're not going to be knocking him right away. But yeah. uh, Sammy really told him off. <laughs> really, huh? That's too yeah, funny. Yeah, That's yeah too hung funny. up on him afterwards and all of that. Uh, See, I, my, myself, Mike, I, I got to be honest, I really like Sammy a lot. I do. And I don't know uh, his persona and everything. I, I don't know. It's just he's a gangster. We used to be in that life, you know. I look at it a different way, don't get me wrong. But there is something charismatic about him and the way that he comes out and the way that he acts, you know. And uh, well, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you how it ended up because uh, Patrick will have a heart attack. Right, right. Um, but uh, it, it, I can tell you it's going to be very interesting to people. Oh, I know. I can't wait. I can't wait. This is like a Metro Goer uh, Mayor production over here. Oh, when this comes out, forget about it. This will be the biggest thing on YouTube. Bobby, I got people telling me uh, I've been waiting for this all my life. This is a bigger day than my wedding day. I, mean, <laughs> I can't believe the stir that it's, it's causing. I'll be honest with you. I never, you know, I knew that there would be interest in it because he and I both have a high profile. But to see the way people are uh, responding to this is, is crazy. You know, it really is. But uh, they, I'll tell you this. They're going to get what they expect. That's oh, I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. I've seen a few little things. You know what? how I look at it now, Mike, and my philosophy with it? You growing up and me growing up, we grew up with cowboys, didn't we? We grew up yeah. with John Wayne. We grew oh, up yeah. with all these guys. Everybody wanted to be a cowboy in the neighborhood and ride horses, am I right? That's right. This newer generation, they grew up with the gangsters. And, and the same way we idolize the cowboys, they're idolizing the gangsters now. And now you got two real main guys with bosses and big families from New York. You know what I'm saying? And now you two are going to go at it. I mean, this is great. It's even great for me. Listen, I was a cop of the gene. I had a big crew. I was going to be a boss, Mike. But I'm, I'm excited about this show. I'm not going to lie to you. I can't wait for it to come out. Well, you know what it was, too, Bobby? In that era, you know, we were both in that era where so many things happened in that life. And we yeah. had different perspectives on it. You know, him being around Gotti and all the stuff that went down and me being, you know, in the Columbos and all the stuff that went down in our family. And, you know, obviously, you know things about each other and you know things that are happening. And uh, we, we talked a lot about that. And he, our perspectives are so different. And he gets, you know, he blows up right away. You know, he gets mad and he's got, and I had to tell him, hey, you know, Sammy, you're not the underboss anymore. Relax, you know, take it <laughs> yeah. You know, and, yeah. and I really had to tell him that because he was getting crazy. You know, he just, just his temperament. Yeah. Uh, but to me, to, to see that in him, you know, in a way I say, wow, after all of these years, this guy has still got that fire in him. You know, he's really got that fire in him. And you know what? He really still believes in the life in a big way. In a big way. It's, uh, I know that, I, I know it sounds crazy being the circumstances with him, but he really does, and, and you know what? This may sound crazy, Bobby, but I think you know, I, have a, I have a kind of a grudging respect for that, you know, because Cousin Oster meant a lot to him, even though the circumstances changed in his life, and boy, he, 
he really lets you know it. And, uh, you know, we disagreed on a lot of things, man, a lot of mm -hmm. things. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you, I want to know something, and believe it or not, I still got a great respect for the life. You know, we lived in that life, like it's part of us, you know, and there's still a lot of that life in me. Uh, not on the bad things, you know, but the way that I handle myself and even shave it every day, and no matter what it is, I mean, it was still so such a big part of me, you know, but Christ knocked a lot of that down. Like I said, Sammy, he's, you know. You know what it is, Bobby? If you take the, the good, I, I got to be careful how I say this, but the good parts of that life, the and respect, many. Yep. the discipline, you know, the respect for authority that we had, the discipline that we had to uh, to live by, um, it, it never left us. No. That, that never left me. No. It never left me. So the, the things that were part of that life that we took that were good, you know, respect for the women that... that we loved in our families mm -hmm. that's good stuff and I, I don't think that'll ever leave us but you know there's, there's good and bad in everything and unfortunately in a lot of ways the bad overran the good and the life you know had a lot of trouble and guys had a lot of trouble and and the oath was violated so often you know because I, I told him I said look betrayal is a big part of that life it is. I mean I think betrayal is a part of life anyway but when you put the extra pressure of you know all these things coming down on you, betrayal is a huge part of that life. And Sammy, he he uh, you know he really firmly went at me on that. And I said, hey, you're, you're living in a friggin' dream world, Sammy. I, I don't know where you're living. You know, we just went back and forth, but uh, it, it got contentious at times. And uh, I understand, you know, like I said, I have a, a grudging respect for the way he looks at the life, but I think he's unrealistic about it, and in, in, uh, for some reason. Well, I think at that point, at this point in time, I think anybody that's still involved in that life, it's unrealistic to a point. Yeah. It's not like it was when we grew up, Mike. No. You know, I grew up around these wise guys in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. By the time the 90s came and we came up, it was wild. It was like Wild West. And that's what's out there right now. You know, I mean, I grew up with these old timers that had suits on every day, Mike. Clashing Absolutely. guys. You know, uh, we know what they did, don't get me wrong. You know, but people look up to them in the neighborhood. People aren't looking up to these people now. No. You know, they're looking at wise guys now that are left up here. They laugh at them, half these people. They don't want to know nothing to do with it. They don't want nothing to do with them, nothing to do with their life. But here's the problem, and I, and I see with Sammy and a little with me, and I don't know, I can't judge you, Mike, but, you know, Marine goes over there, he goes into combat, he comes home, all these veterans, and they're still soldiers in their hearts, you know? They wear their patches, they, they, you know, they join these veteran clubs, and they're always going to be soldiers. And guys like us are always going to be soldiers. Yeah. But we're going to decide for who. And me and you made that decision, I guess. We know who we're going to be soldiers for now, Mike. I love the way you put that, Bobby. It's so true, you know? Thank you. Really, really uh, that was a good way to sum that up. We just uh, we just have the correct loyalty now, right? And, uh, but you know the the preparation was good. It really was, you know, um, in, in many many ways. And unfortunately, we had to do things that were offensive and, uh, and weren't the right thing. But in other ways, we were prepared properly for what God wanted us to do. And and uh, yeah, I guess that's the way we have to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, your past molded you to what you are today, Mike. Yeah. You know, that's how I look at it. You, you know, know, your I, past was a big part of who God made you today. You know, I, I tell you, I, I'll share this with you. you. You know, I'm sure about my dad. Well, he dies at 103. My dad, Bobby, you could have uh, you could have cut off both arms, both legs. He would have never opened his mouth. He stood by his oath. But the reason he stood, and I knew my dad intimately well, and I respected him for that. Don't get me wrong because his legacy was 
was so important to him. It was everything to him. And he never would want to be known as anything but a stand-up guy. That's right. who he was his whole life. So he didn't want to be known as anything else. And I said to him, I said, Dad, I get it. I understand that. But understand this. Our whole family was destroyed as a result of you being part of that life. My family was seriously hurt as a, part, as a result of my being part of that life. And he would never accept responsibility for that. He would tell me, Mike, I was framed. If I, if I wasn't framed, none of this would have happened. Because my family, you know, sister dies of an overdose of drugs. My brother turns an informant and, you know, puts people in trouble, puts my father back in jail. My mother, you know, 33 years without a husband. At, at the end of her relationship with my dad before she passed away, it was ugly. Her and my dad, it was just so ugly to be in the, their presence at the same time because she blamed him for everything that went wrong. So mm -hmm. I said to him, Dad, you weren't framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. We were framed because we were on the street. And we know that the system is not always fair. But we That's put right. a bullseye on our back. The government's going to come after us. It's not right that they do what they do. They're supposed to be, you know, consistent with the law. But, hey, we're guys on the street. They're going to do what they got to do. I said, and you won't take responsibility for really destroying your family. Yeah. Uh, like I almost did mine. And he would, he would really get angry with me. No, don't tell me that. I said, Dad, you got to face the truth, man. That's why this life is a bad life. And we would have that. And I didn't do it to make him feel bad. I was trying to get to him, um, you know, through, I was trying to feed him Christ mm -hmm. to make him accept the Lord. And I think he did. I really do think he did, Bobby. I, I, I carry guilt around with me because I don't think I did enough to bring my father to the Lord because it was very hard for me to talk to him. I sent chaplains in to, uh, prison to, to speak to him. There was one chaplain that told me that he did accept Christ. She read the Bible with him. He accepted Christ. I got that in my heart. That's, that's what I hold on to because I didn't do as good a job as I should have with my dad. I really believe that. But, um, you know, we have faith in the Lord, and hopefully, uh, hopefully he's up in heaven now. I really hope my mom, too. Yeah, praise God. You know, you know, Mike, God comes and takes the heart, you know. I really believe, you know, if your father really um, was committed to it, was reading the Bible, took Christ in his heart, he didn't have to be like us. You know, you don't got to be a holy Bible to be saved, a holy uh, uh, jumper to be saved. Everybody knows that, you know. People think you do, but you don't. As long as that word touched your father's heart and he found a good heart, your father's saved, praise God. And let's okay. just pray for that, you know? And thank you did you, what you man. did. You did enough. Well, thank you. And, you know, people should understand that, you know, as Christians, we're never going to be perfect. No. You know, I say this all the time, you know. One of, one of the things that I hold in my heart, the Bible says that at times the sins of the father fall on the children, fall they on the don't. son. And I pray all the time, Lord, you know, don't ever let that happen to my kids. I got seven beautiful kids. I got grandchildren. Don't let them suffer for anything that I might have done in my life. But I tell people, and God has really honored that for me. But even if that were to happen, Bobby, I might get angry with God. I might, I don't know what I might fall away for a minute. But I can never disbelieve him. Because for me, the evidence is, is too powerful, what he's done in my life and the life of others, such as yourself and other people that we know that have come through such hard times and have been so impacted by the Lord and their life is transformed. I can never disbelieve in him. So, And I think that's what we hold to be true. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to fall every once in a while. We're certainly going to be better. And that's what, that's what uh, people should realize. God does make you better. And yeah. you know... And you know this, Jesus of Nazareth was the most, he was the only true man's man that ever lived. Yeah. And if we emulate Jesus throughout our lives, we're going to be better people. Yeah. It's a win-win situation to emulate Jesus. And mm -hmm. I tell guys to try to reach them, look, if he wasn't the son of God, well, when you're dead, you're dead anyway. So what did you have to lose? But if you emulate him throughout your life, you're going to be a better person in every respect to try to be like Jesus was. That's right. So, and then knowing that he is the Savior of the world, well, we got a bowl of eternity to, to gain from that, and that's everything. Nothing else in life matters but where we're going to spend eternity. When you break it down, cut to the chase, like we used to say in our, on the street, that's what it's all about. Where are we going to spend eternity? That's well, it. you know, Mike, I don't know if you know, but I lost my daughter in... Uh... 
December 2019. No, I didn't know that. Before. My oldest. And uh, Danielle was a devout Christian. She prayed in tongues. You know, we all have the gifts. My kids have their gifts. And, uh, but she had some problems. And, um, but I, I know, and I know that she rests in Christ, Mike, you know. And that's the only thing that gives me peace in my heart, to know that she rests in Christ. Well, that, that is peaceful, believe me. You know, that's, that's the biggest peace that we could have to know that we're going to be reunited again, you know, in, in eternity. I mean, that's what it's all about, Bobby. It is. It, well, so, well, Mike, I want to thank you again for coming on the show tonight. This was great. You know, praise God that you came on. And uh, hopefully we're going to get together soon again. And uh, we'll, we'll be talking, Mike. But thank well, you again Bobby, for giving your time to me. Listen, thank you for having me. I have a lot of respect and a lot of regard for you, Bobby. I, I believe you you know, what you've done in your life is amazing because I know how difficult it is to make that transformation. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you're using it all for God's glory. And, uh, you know, just continue, brother. And anything I can do to help or be alongside you, you know, you got my support. Thank you, brother. And God bless. God bless, my friend. And give, give your mom a hug for me. I will. I will, Mike. Right, <laughs> Thank care. you, brother. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, brother. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.